Okay, uh, so we're going to be exploring what realism is as a literary and artistic movement. Um, it's going to take place uh, pretty much after the Civil War in the United States, and uh, we still see its effects today, although the height of realism is really between the Civil War and uh, what we might consider World War I. So, um, before we move on, I think it's important to remember the other big cultural and artistic movements in the United States. Uh, so far in this course, we've really studied three before realism. First, we had Puritan writing, uh, and Puritan writing comes with uh, the Puritans. Um, we still see it today, but the basic purpose of the writing was uh, to glorify God, to make uh, your society uh, the best example and the best uh interpretation of what God wants. Um, so that you saw that reflected in the way people treated nature, the way people treated each other, the way people treated writing. Um, that included people like John Winthrop saying he's going to make a city on a hill. People like Edward Taylor saying, Lord, make me thy spinning wheel. Um, basically, it's an attempt to do what God wants you to do. Um, the next big movement we looked at was enlightenment. Um, enlightenment is now using reason uh, it kind of comes from both the scientific revolution and then the enlightenment in Europe. Uh, but the basic premise of enlightenment is that you can observe the world for yourself and you can use reason to help you determine things. You don't have to just listen to the Bible. Um, both Puritan and enlightenment writing are, are part of much larger cultural movements and also political movements and social movements. Then we looked at Romanticism. So Romanticism is primarily an artistic movement. And the idea is trying to envision a world that you can then imitate. Uh, so the basic premise of Romanticism is like, uh, you know, try and inspire people with your art. Try and make people uh, feel a strong emotion with your art. Uh, the idea was that, you know, life can imitate art. So come up with these wonderful visions in art and life will follow. Uh, romanticism is really taking place between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, um, although we still see it all the time today. Our next big movement is realism. And realism, for uh, simplicity's sake, is the opposite of this romantic idea that life imitates art. Realism posits that art should imitate life. Um, so it's a little bit of a different uh, philosophy behind the reason why you're making art. The idea is if you make art imitate life, you can better understand what's happening and then possibly do something about it. So here you have a quintessential American realist painting. Um, it's, uh, it's by a guy named John Sloan, and it's essentially just a picture of working class people at the docks. This is a very good foundational point for realism. Um, so just to provide another contrast, here's a classic romantic painting from a guy we've studied so far, Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole is the founder of um, the Hudson River Valley School, uh, or the Hudson River School. Uh, it's called the Garden of Eden. It's meant to evoke like the five eyes of romanticism, inspiration, individualism, uh, imagination, intuition, and uh, I don't know if I can remember the fifth one. Anyways, so th the idea is, is like create a world for the reader to enter or the audience to enter, um, inspire the audience. It doesn't necessarily have to look like reality. Now, let's take a look at a, another classic realist painting. Um, I'm sure you can notice the obvious difference. This isn't a Garden of Eden, this is like a bar. Um, but more importantly, if you pause and, and try and take stock of everything that's going on in this painting, even though the people have a little bit of like an impressionist kind of color scheme going on. The idea is that you are trying to create an image that closely imitates what's actually present in everyday life. So um, this is another John Sloan painting. It's called McSorley's Bar, which is a real bar in New York City in Manhattan. Um, it's uh, and it's painted in 1912. And if you were to go to this bar in 1912, chances are this is the kind of bar that you would find. So uh, a little bit of context on this. This is John Sloan. Um, he grew up in cities. He grew up in Philadelphia. 
Um, he really began his career as a newspaper illustrator, like a lot of realists. He uh, also had close ties to newspapers, which is a pretty good indication of what kind of art they're making, right? They're trying to kind of inform the public. Um, he definitely had a, uh, I wouldn't say a rough life, but he was pretty well acquainted with the problems of society. I mean, his wife was an alcoholic, um, and his wife was also a former prostitute. So he, he basically had like pretty close connection to some of the things that are common depictions in realist work. Um, he moved to New York City where he lived in Greenwich, um, and uh, that's where he lived and painted most of his life. He became a socialist party member. Um, in a lot of ways, realist artists tended towards things like socialism, um, which was uh, basically trying to um, reform society in such a way. So the idea of realism is that you're trying to make a better society by depicting what's actually going on. Um, and John Sloan is uh, one of the founders of something called the Ashcan School of American Painting. So you compare this with the Hudson River School, which is all about painting beautiful landscapes and inspiring people. Uh, the Ashcan is kind of like painting the poor and the disenfranchised, like the, the bottom levels of society, so that people can become educated about it. Um, here's another good example of Ashcan painting. Uh, this is... Snow in New York by Robert Henry. Um, you have uh, this George Bellows painting, um, both members of this club. So you can see how just kind of violent it is, um, how, uh, you know, this is not shying away from anything that's ugly. This is kind of embracing what society is doing at this time, which is going to boxing matches in like dark, dank places. Um, and then here you have maybe one of our best realist paintings for understanding realist literature. Um, here you've got a George Bellows painting called The Cliff Dwellers. Um, it's painted in 1913. Um, and uh, this is actually a pretty good way for understanding the kind of realist literature that's taking place in cities, where the setting is in cities. So, what is realism? Uh, it actually began in France uh, right after the Revolution of 1848. So in France, there were there's actually been a series of revolutions. Uh, 1848 was not only a revolution in France, but it was also in Germany. It was in um, uh, countries all throughout Eastern Europe. And the purpose of this revolution was a social revolution, where the people rose up to reform the already primarily democratic governments that they had. Um, after this revolution, realism was instated to, to kind of be like a almost like a megaphone for the common people. Um, so realists really believe in this idea that there's an objective reality um, and that you can portray it in art and you can portray it to convey truth and accuracy. Um, so realist writing and painting tries to set down observations as objectively as possible. Um, it kind of rejects this idea that uh, there's like idealism and inspiration that you can find in art um, it more so tries to replicate what's actually going on in society. So another way to think of this, um, Puritanism, the writer is, is just replicating what God wants you to, to, to read. And the reader is kind of the disciple of the writer. Um, in enlightenment, you have the writer is, uh, like a teacher and the student is the reader. Um, in Romanticism, the writer is kind of creating this world that you enter and the reader is just this visitor. Whereas in Realism, as much as possible, the writer is trying to be just like a camera lens and the reader is the observer, the scientific observer who's taking it objectively. So uh, this, I think this is a good way to see what the reader's relationship is to the writing in each of these genres. Um, so some vocabulary to review verisimilitude, mimesis, diction, and vernacular. Uh, you can pause and just kind of uh, get these definitions down if you're not quite sure what they are yet. Um, but here are some common features of realism in literature. Uh, it tries to portray things as objectively as possible, if it can. Um, so there's an emphasis on trying to treat something truthfully, right? Not necessarily convey things based on emotion, but convey them based on 
as real as you can make it. So even in realist painting, when there's like colors that are uh, seem a little bit unnatural, it's the realist trying to recreate light. So here in this painting by George Bellows, you actually have um, the uh, the idea that like the center of the ring is bathed in light, and that's why you have all this kind of like darkness surrounding them. Um, you also in realism you have characters that are almost taking center stage over the plot. So the idea is present this character in all their uh, complexity and the plot follows. That's very different than romanticism where you kind of create this like complex plot and the character is just a tool within it. Um, so characters are tried to, the realists try to portray characters as realistically as possible with all their flaws. Um, and then you also have the, the diction or the style of writing. Um, so in realism, as much as possible, uh, especially characters use vernacular language rather than, um, you know, some kind of heightened language. You also, as much as possible, have the writer trying to use vernacular rather than like this deeply poetic language. So in romanticism, like Edgar Allan Poe or some other uh, romantic authors, the language is actually pretty hard to understand just to figure out what's going on because the writer is trying to like create this beautiful sentence structure. Realists are very much about just telling the reader this is what's going on. Um, if the writing is difficult to understand in realism, it's because they're trying to be as specific as possible. Um, you also have, uh, as much as possible, the writer trying to mimic what's actually happening. So, um, again, this is the idea that life should, uh, you know, not try and imitate art, but art should try and imitate life. So, um, why realism? We talked a little bit about the revolutions of 1848, um, which you could learn about in European history in college, but basically the idea behind these revolutions was that the common people were rising up and demanding more say. Um, and in the second half of the 20th century, while you have all these social changes, the common people are in some ways being left out. Um, so actually in the United States, realism comes on a little bit after realism in Europe uh, for reasons we're going to get into. But there's a literary critic named Amy Kaplan, and she called realism a strategy for imagining and managing the threats of social change. So in other words, trying to instead of trying to imagine um, all the wonderful things that you can, you can accomplish, uh, like in romanticism, you're trying to imagine all of the problems that come with social change and then portray those problems. Um, so, some historical context for the U.S. realist movement. Um, the U.S. is growing really, really rapidly, um, and so you have westward expansion that's taking Americans into previously uncharted territory, even after the Civil War. Um, and what this means is that a lot of people are becoming citizens, and the population's growing, and you have more people who need to become educated, and... Uh, this uh, this new like middle class that's going to emerge demands knowledge about the rest of their country. Uh, so, for more context, people want to basically do like armchair travel. So, as the U.S. is expanding, people want to know more about it. And so, having realist descriptions of San Francisco is a lot more helpful than having romantic descriptions of San Francisco. People want to know what's actually going on. Uh, you also have conflict happening with this expansion, and so people want to know about these conflicts. So uh, Native American populations are becoming displaced, and um, only realists are going to basically be able to portray this objectively without tainting it with their own kind of um, interpretations of it. So again, the idea is to try and portray this expansion as objectively as possible. Um, you also have the Civil War itself, which is kind of like a, in some ways, it's a um, just a contrast to this idea of romanticism. Romanticism is all about, like, just imagine this wonderful future. And the Civil War was this awful, awful event in um, most Americans' opinions at this time. Uh, you have 2% of the population dying during the war. Uh, a million casualties. That's more casualties than all of the other American wars combined. So this is this pretty horrific event in all Americans' lives, no matter what your 
um, you know, what race you're associated with or what culture you're associated with. It's this really traumatic event. Um, and so in a lot of ways, the Civil War kind of kills a lot of the idealism that um, Romanticism sought to portray. And then even with freed slaves, you have Reconstruction that's kind of killing the Romanticism. So in some ways, the Civil War is like the ultimate reality check. Uh, you also have a rising urban population. Um, so again, people want to know the objective descriptions of life in urban cities rather than these necessarily romantic descriptions of nature that they don't actually know about. Um, so by 1900, most of the U.S. population is living in cities, and there's this need to kind of portray urban culture objectively so that people can identify with it. Um, you also have this kind of uh, renewed interest in portraying the realities and the struggles of urban life. So, for instance, in New York City's Lower East Side, uh, you have the most densely populated place on Earth. And so having these romantic descriptions of like the Hudson River are not going to work on this population or even the middle class interested in this population. There's a, there's a demand to know what's actually going on. Um, so here you've got, again, a realist painting of a street scene by George Lukes. Um, you also have immigration. So you have lots and lots and lots of new people coming to the United States. The U.S. is essentially built on immigration. And uh, just by 1910, you have 13 and a half million people who are first generation immigrants living in the United States. Um, and Americans want to know about immigrants. They want to know something about their culture. Um, you also have industrial factories. And uh, there were a lot of safety concerns with this. There were a lot of uh, health concerns with this. And so portraying factories romantically kind of stops working by the time you have tons and tons of Americans working in factories. Uh, again, you have an educated middle class that's wanting to know about the problems of the lower class. Um, you also have, in some ways, these large corporations that are having massive amounts of power um, over this lower class. The industrial system pretty much alienates the lower class uh, into these mechanized roles where they're just, for lack of a better word, just punching a button over and over and over again or assembling a piece of machinery over and over and over again. Um, and it's kind of, not only is it dehumanizing, but it's uh, dangerous. And so you have, again, a middle class that wants to portray this and you have artists who are curious about um, trying to portray things in a, like almost a mechanized industrial way. And that's realism, trying to be as objective as possible. Um, and maybe another, maybe the biggest reason for realism is new technology that kind of um, makes people curious about what the technology has and also what you can do with that technology. So you have railroads, steamships, uh, you have newspapers that kind of work with these things, uh, telephone, camera, suddenly people can get information right away and people have a demand to know what's actually going on. Um, the camera is maybe the most important of these because it becomes a, a tool for the realist. Um, you can pause and take a look at this painting, or excuse me, this photo, but um, this is a photo by of maybe the, the most famous early American photographer, Jacob Rees. It's called Bandit's Roost. This was known as like one of the most infamous crime alleys in the Lower East Side. Uh, and it's taking place in 1888 at the height of urban expansion, the height of immigration, um, the height of industrial of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Um, and here you have this alley that is in some ways meant to portray just how like kind of menacing and uh, dangerous of a place that New York City could be. Um, here's another photo by Jacob Rees. Uh, it's called Children Sleeping on Mulberry Street, which is a street in the Lower East Side. So again, just by showing objectively what's happening, you don't have to create emotions for the reader. All you have to do is just show them what's happening. And that was kind of the idea of the realists. There's no need for fantasy here. Uh, what there's a need of is reality. Um, so Jacob Rees uh, himself had a really, really tough life. He came to the U.S. from Denmark. He was the third of 15 children. He had 
very, very many different jobs. Uh, he lived in all the big cities of the U.S. at the time. Um, there were times when he felt he, ha he was sleeping on streets. Um, and at some point, he became a newspaper editor. Uh, basically, he knew how to write, and um, newspapers were expanding rapidly. In some ways, newspapers were like a boom industry. Um, so he became a writer, but uh, he wanted to find a new way to kind of capture all the, the squalid conditions that he was actually seeing. Um, and so in comes the, the photograph. So the photograph had existed even during the time of Lincoln, but um, for the first time he had flash photography that allowed you to take photos in dark places. Uh, and Jacob Reese took a team out to New York City and he just took pictures of the conditions of the Lower East Side and the tenements. Um, he published a book called How the Other Half Lives, implying the other half of the U.S. population, the, the lower class studies among the tenements of New York. And um, it was just a collection of photos with some text to accompany it. And uh, this became, you know, like a, a huge bestseller among this uh, emerging middle class that, uh, you know, with a growing population, you have a lower class, right, that is going to expand because you need low wage jobs. But you also have a middle class that's expanding, a managerial class that's very well educated. Um, that's kind of reaping the benefits of a new public education system. And this is the public that is being written to with realism. The audience is wealthy middle class people, or excuse me, just middle class people, not wealthy middle class people, just middle class people who care. Um, and this realist uh, kind of explosion really takes place in the 1890s um, after these technological and social and political changes have taken place, you have realism as this kind of like almost the um, this protest against all of these different changes and people just like eat it up. They want to know everything that's happening in the cities. They want to know everything that's happening out west. They want to know everything that's happening um, in behind closed doors in politics. Um, so with the expansion of newspapers, the expansion of photos, you have the expansion of realism and realist writing. Um, lastly, you have two kind of subgenres of realism, um, and both of these you can find in classic realist works like Maggie and Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane. Um, first, you have something called the local color or regionalism. Um, the idea is to mimic or portray local cultures as accurately as possible. This is kind of a um, uh, in some ways, it's like a newspaper going in and reporting, but in other ways, it's really embracing and celebrating like accents, celebrating uh, local dress and local customs. Here you've got a painting of the potato eaters by Van Gogh, um, and the idea is you're just trying to portray what it's like to live and act and behave in a certain area. Um, then you have something called naturalism, whereas regionalism is just trying to mimic a local area. Naturalism is like a philosophical position. It's this idea that you are defined by your region. You're defined by the environment you live in. Um, and it actually makes a story to show this position. So naturalism believes that your lives are predetermined basically by the environment you live in. So it's kind of this like warped version of Puritanism. Your fate is determined by the physical environment you live in, not necessarily by God. Um, so naturalism is this idea that human beings are uh, products in their environment. They need to be studied in their environment, so they use regionalism. But the idea is that eventually these people are going to be, anything they do is defined by their environment. So um, it relies on this idea of determinism. There's a long history of determinism, you know, Isaac Newton said that determinism was uh, basically, it came from gravity, right? And so people are determined by gravity and their movements are determined by gravity. Biological determinism, Charles Darwin said that basically people's traits and how well those traits adapt to the physical environment determined their success. Um, you had economic determinism. People like Karl Marx said that, um, you know, basically social classes have to and inevitably are going to clash because um, people don't have enough food to eat. And so you 
also have psychological determinism. People like uh, Sigmund Freud basically said, the way you even think and the way that you feel is determined by early experiences that you had no control over. Like if your dad hits you, you're going to be a violent person. So determinism is a scientific idea that's emerging. You are defined by your economic environment. You're defined by your genes and your traits. You're defined by your early childhood experiences. So in naturalism, a branch of realism, um, you have this attempt to kind of show that free will doesn't exist. There's no such thing as free will. Um, they use almost a scientific method to write. The idea is to like show somebody in a complete natural environment and by showing them in this environment, you will eventually show that they are completely determined by this environment. Um, so uh, just a little bit more about this. Um, the characters in naturalist literature are basically like, um, they're completely defined by their environment. So they are almost inhuman in a way. Um, you could think of them as like just features of their environment. Um, the point of view is always third person in naturalist literature. Um, the narrator doesn't ever make comments. It just shows what's happening. Um, the setting is almost always urban settings or it's like uh, a really destructive natural setting. So um, the idea is you're showing nature just overwhelming any attempt to exert human free will. So just to take it back to realism. At its heart, realism, it's, it's just trying to be truthful. And we see it all the time today. Um, any basic movement that you see in movies is either tending towards romanticism or tending towards realism today. Um, various things like surrealism or magical realism, these are all grounded in the, the idea that you have to show some sort of truth to believe anything. So just to kind of conclude, realists really think that the best way to educate somebody or the best way to get somebody to think about your art is to show what's actually happening in reality. And uh, that's it.